headlines today. Yeah, so here we go. John Calipari is apparently the new head coach at Arkansas, as the Hogs have called him from Kentucky. Uh, Wes Moore works at the Buzz Radio in Arkansas, also works for the Fox station up there. I contacted him about an hour ago. He has, does a radio show until 4, had another hit at 4.30, then he does television, probably will be with us tomorrow. He was the first one to have this story and multiple sources. And I got to tell you, and I know Wes, been on his show. I thought that maybe that was another, well, they're excited about this at Arkansas, like Louisville thought they had Scott Drew or somebody else, but Wes hits it out of the park. I have not seen anything that's completely official on this yet, but when Bob Holt and others in Arkansas start to report it, you can call it money. Now, what does all this mean? John Fanta, who, of course, is a part of the field of 58. Calipari said he's six, field of 68, said he had bad feelings about his situation at Kentucky. The lack of support had grown to the point where he didn't feel like he could stay on because he didn't feel wanted. The assets that Arkansas Tyson Foods brings to the table put in place, convinced him to make this move, and apparently not only a lot of money for Calipari, but also a tremendous commitment to NIL, too. Oh, that's not surprising. What is surprising is that um, he let it get to this point because uh, Jeff Goodman tweeted out something similar last night in that you know, Arkansas is prepared to give him everything he needs. And I'm like, well, Kentucky wasn't giving him everything he needs. It seemed to let Calipari, and I know Jeff Goodman wasn't doing this, but by saying that Kentucky wasn't supporting him enough, lets him off the hook for him not being what they were paying him for at Kentucky, which... Um, I've seen Andy Staples say this. I've seen Reddit College Football say this. I've seen a lot of people say this. This is either a great move by Arkansas or this is Arkansas's Jimbo Fisher move where, you know, they go and get this big name who's got these accomplishments, but he's he's not really as wanted where he was as, as maybe he was just a couple years prior to that, and things have changed. So he's a fantastic basketball coach. He's a legendary. He's going to be a Hall of Fame basketball coach for sure. But at the end of the day, um, you know, he's not really been that great for the last few years. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Arkansas swung a big stick and got themselves a Hall of Fame coach and can't blame them for trying. So if it fails like A&M and Jimbo Fisher, then that's just the price of doing business and the price of trying to get to the mountaintop and, and get your program to where you want it to be and where you feel that it should be. But, yeah, it was shocking to see that headline. As much as things just don't seem to really have any uh, unofficial or official rules in college sports these days. Uh, this was still one of those where it's no matter how many shocking things we tend to see now, whether it's the transfer portal or whatever else, uh, this was still something that just seemingly came kind of out of nowhere and, and blew people away, uh, myself included. So, yeah, it's a huge hire for Arkansas, a huge amount of investment, and huge, uh, I guess, risk in it in a way, but not really because what is your alternative? I mean, you lost Eric Musselman. What are you going to go do? You can go just hire some dude that kind of mm -hmm. gets people excited. So you got the fan base fired up because you went and stole Kentucky's coach. You went and stole the coach from the top program in the country. But, yeah, there are definitely – Jimbo Fisher vibes with this and for Calipari um, you know from his standpoint okay I get run out in a year from now or I go get a brand new deal and I start back from square one and I don't even have any pressure whatsoever outside of just the natural pressure of being John Calipari and expected to win because Arkansas is not going to fire me after one year but if I flail again at Kentucky I'm yeah. out of there so uh, he was good either way. He's going to collect his money either way, and he's already, you know, made made more money than God at this point in his career. But uh, it was definitely getting a little bit heated uh, there in Lexington, uh, given the expectations and given the lack of reaching those expectations uh, coming on a few years now. So great timing for him to move on, uh, stay within the conference, and stay familiar with everything. He'll be able to take advantage of the transfer portal um, and have a big backing behind him, as you mentioned there, with the uh, NIL money. So, yeah, I mean, leaves a, a huge job, but you can see why it makes sense to go to Arkansas right now. So, once the thing, what, do you, what happens here? You already started seeing speculation that if Musselman goes to USC, Calipari, Kentucky, to Arkansas, what's next? Uh, here is Jeff Goodman, fieldof68.com, his uh, six names. Scott Drew, Bruce Pearl, Nate Oates, which just had the great run to the Final Four, Billy Donovan, Sean Miller, Ole Miss's Chris Beard, who's been at Tech and also, of course, was at Texas and for a cup of coffee at UNLV, 
Those are some names. Who else on the list? There's a, a couple of gambling sites that are putting these names at the top. Nate Oates. There's Drew, Pearl, Donovan, same names. Dan Hurley, who's playing for the national title tonight. We'll get to that. Otso Berger at Iowa State. Rick Patino, Jay Wright, who's retired. Mark Pope at BYU and also the field of everybody else underneath of those names. Well, Mark Pope is a Kentucky grad. He was on the 96 championship team under Rick Patino, So he, he would make some sense there. Billy Donovan was an assistant on that 96 team before he got the Florida job. Uh, so, or assistant at Kentucky, maybe at 96 team before he got the Florida job. Uh, and he's always kind of been the Kentucky dream, you know, for coming back, but is he going to leave the bulls to go to Kentucky? That would be and to go do college basketball again after he hasn't done it in a while. And it's changed drastically since he got there. Uh, yeah, he's going to be on any list until they find out. No, because Kentucky's one of those jobs that could, I mean, they did it with they did it with Calipari. No, he was at Memphis. Memphis did it with Calipari. But, like, teams have gone into the NBA and gotten guys out of it um, in the past, although it's a lot different now. TJ Altsberger is an interesting one to me because here's an up-and-coming coach. He would be on that second tier to me of, you know, say Kentucky hits the same wall that a lot of big programs have, whether it be football or basketball where they're like, okay, we want Scott Drew, we want Billy Donovan, and we want Nate Oates, and all those people like, well, I'm kind of good where I'm at, and I'm successful where I'm at right now, and I'm, and the money's about the same, so there's a lot of, you know, I don't, I don't really want to dive into that pool. Well, if you go to TJ Altsberger, he's, he's kind of in the up and coming there at Iowa State, so a guy like that makes a little sense to me, same like Mark Prope, although he is, again, an alumni or alumnus of the, of the university, uh, look, Dan Hurley leaving UConn to go to Connecticut. I don't, I don't know, other than, you know, long-term conference stability, I don't know why you'd do that. Yeah, Dan Hurley wouldn't make much sense given he's probably, possibly going to win his second national title in a row tonight. I mean, unless you're just bored in stores. He's favored to, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're sitting there looking at probably a second title and – uh, why pick up and leave for an Arkansas job that's not better than the UConn job, no matter what league you're in. Um, but it is a good job, and that's why it's got a really impressive list of uh, uh, targets. And I'm, I'm saying Arkansas, but uh, the Kentucky job. Kentucky job's right there with the UConn job. I got that mixed up, but uh, it's the Kentucky job. So, like, when Alabama opened up, uh, there's going to be all the biggest names possible. Um, you know, obviously, with Alabama, you can start to – Nick one off one by one of like uh, Kirby Smart's obviously not going to take this job and Steve Sarkeesian's not going to take this job. But I think for Kentucky, like with the exception of guys like that, like a Dan Hurley, where you go like, yeah, he doesn't really need to take that one. Um, I mean, they're pretty much wide open to get, you would think, whoever they want to. Like, um, well, I haven't seen Shaka Smart's name on here, who I, I think that they would love to see Kentucky go back to playing that style of basketball. And, and I don't know. Marquette's a great yeah, basketball school. I don't know. Maybe they're scared off by what he did at Texas, which was not anything close to what he was able to do at Marquette. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, they're going to have their pick of the litter uh, for the most part. And, obviously, we'll get into Scott Drew a bit more. I saw him on another list where he was – you know, one-to-one -one odds, the very top choice. Uh, and I know some of this is just trying to get people to, to pony up uh, their their cash and bet on it. But uh, here he is getting mentioned for another job after just getting uh, talked about earlier this, this offseason uh, with another big job So uh, with Louisville. So, uh, yeah, back to the state of Kentucky rumors here for, for yep. folks in this area. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's an extremely attractive job, high pressure, but it's the kind of gig like coaching the – the Lakers or the Cowboys or whatever that's going to be appealing to a lot of people. No question. So those are the uh, names of the various coaches, and, and there's maybe two or three that aren't listed that are that could be in the middle of that. Now, one of the things, Ashley Hodge, who's a huge Baylor basketball, not only fan, he's a Baylor alum, but also travels quite a bit with them. Uh, he'll join us at 3.30 to give us his insight. He wrote something in the premium section. If you're not a member, you can be. It's a great section of a lot of inside information. He will join us on what he wrote and what he said at around 3.30. Now, uh, let's say tonight, Kentucky, uh, excuse me, Connecticut and Purdue. These two teams have been on a collision course. Am I right the way that Gonzaga and Baylor were on a collision course for a couple of years and now we'll finally get that game tonight? UConn, yet again, another double-digit win. Purdue was way too much for NC State and DJ Burns. This is the game I think everyone wanted, at least 
If you wanted to talk about the collision course, then we have it going on tonight in Phoenix. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing particularly Edie versus Klingon. Um, <laughs> I thought it was funny they had uh, DJ Burns mic'd up the other night, and I saw the clip, and he was like, listen, excuse my language, but, man, you big as hell. <laughs> when he said that to, to Zach Edie. And, and, look, NC State fought and fought and fought. I mean, they, they just, for a long time, wouldn't go away, and then, you know, kind of ran out of gas there at the end. Alabama... Alabama kept within firing range for a little while. You know, they're, they're good enough, but these were the two best teams all year long. You know, when we get a final like this, it's kind of the first time the two best, it's the first time since 2021 that the two best teams all year long wind up in the final. So, um, you know, I'm sure one side, if you're a fan of Connecticut, you're a fan of Purdue, you hope you see a Gonzaga-Baylor where your side is Baylor and the other side is Gonzaga, but I, I think we're in for a, for a doozy tonight. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, I don't know. I could see this going pretty favorably for UConn. Um, but, you know, Purdue's a, a really strong team, the number one seed for a reason. Um, you know, handled their business, as you said, with NC State. And uh, we didn't have too much drama this weekend. Uh, I think the drama was to be found elsewhere in, in sports and entertainment this weekend and not in the men's tournament per se. But, uh, yeah, I mean, UConn's a, a juggernaut. Um, they're just – unbelievably fun to watch and how they're put together and the talent that they have uh then purdue is uh, a little less fun to watch i mean in comparison but they've got the uh the man in zach Eady that obviously uh is uh, a lightning rod for his size and his style and and just how uh, tough he is of a matchup so yeah ought to be fun i'm looking forward to it i'm not like over the moon you know getting my popcorn ready just yet but i am looking forward to getting home later on tonight and seeing how this season closes out uh whether it's you know purdue getting a a big national title uh, win that they have not been able to to grasp for that athletic department all that often, or if it's UConn just continuing to build on what is uh, already one of the college football Blue Bloods resumes. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting either way. Matt Jones, who's uh, a part of Sports Radio in Kentucky, KY Sports Radio, a video uh, that one of the stations, WKYT in Lexington, John Calipari walking uh, his dog, it was asked for a comment, and he said no comment. So there's that, the latest of anybody that's had a chance to even see him at all. Well, Kentucky Sports Radio is, and Matt Jones is their biggest outlet by far, mm -hmm. and it's one of the biggest college sports-specific outlets, uh, period. So, yeah, they're going to be all over that. I, I don't know. That's kind of cringy, the whole – Local camera guy walks up on the guy walking his dog. I understand that's how the news business works, so I'm not judging that in any way. But just the interaction, I was like, okay, that's that's cool. Him walking his tiny little dog and having nothing to say. But that's where we are, and that's um, you know the position that he's in as as head coach there. They're they're wanting some answers from him, and I totally understand that. So we'll see when we hear from Calipari again. Uh, but yeah, that little uh, interaction didn't provide much of anything other than he was obviously uncomfortable and. And we'll see where it goes now. All right. Now, um, this is from Paul Catalina. The I'm, man who doesn't watch women's basketball. I'm just saying. He, he has found that. Misspelled Caitlin, but that, that's all right. That, oh, uh, yeah. What is she? What is she? How does she spell it? L-I-N. L-I-N? Oh, I'm sorry. It, well, it, then, I, well, then I'm talking so about a different person. There you go. You even just, you, here you are. You do. But. Caitlin Clark is so damn fun to watch. I she never is. thought in my lifetime I would ever see you say that about any women's basketball player. You know, I am I'm not like most people that uh, you know, I decide that I'm going to be one thing and only be that thing for the rest of my life. If that was the case, uh, you would see me sitting here in He-Man pajamas. I I'm mm. uh, you know, cool. I I think people can grow. Um, I think people can change. I think things can happen to where uh, something you did not enjoy previously, you enjoy even if for a short time now. Um, I will say it again. My dislike or boredom with women's college basketball just came that there was most of the games I had to sit through were one really great team with excellent players that would have been fun to watch had they played against themselves. But since they weren't and they were so much better than everyone else, even the supposed other good teams in their conference. You know, I, I just remember like sitting with Butch Henry, sometimes our, our former co-host, um, uh, who would not have given a crap about the eclipse today, by the way, I thought about that, but yeah. at all. <laughs> he saw the first one. It's fine. Right. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, but uh, he would say, Oh, Texas is coming. I'm like, no, they're not. All the good players are at Baylor and in Connecticut and you know, then South Carolina, 
No, Notre Dame. That's Notre it. Notre yeah. Dame. Like, yeah. it, there was this collection of about eight schools that just kind of shifted through. And then, of course, Connecticut had the run like South Carolina's having right now, oh, except no. they won. Times four. Yeah, except they won all of them. Yeah. You know, South Carolina's gotten beat. But, like, as far as the wins, you know, like, ridiculous. So it was just to me, I was like, well, this is just hard to watch for 40 games a year when there's only three of them that are really good, tight games. Like, you know, let's fast forward to the end of the game. Let's see if it's good. If not, I don't really care. But now, I think in the era, and I said this before, past Brittany Griner. Brittany Griner, uh, Brittany Griner a decade ago was someone who got people excited, women excited about playing women's sports, playing women's basketball, and it was cool. It got to be cool. There was someone who was doing different things. Now, fast forward a decade when we have not just Caitlin Clark, but... Um, Juju Watkins and Angel Reese and, you know, all the page Beckers and all these really fun players to watch who are all better and talent spread across a lot better than it was. There's no longer just eight teams that are good. There's now about 24, 25. So you have a legit top 25 now and there are upsets where they weren't before. So the sport has gotten better. So I, I remain open to changing. I'm not saying I was right or wrong. It's just how I felt. Okay. Well, I never thought I'd see you t- tweet that. So yeah. I'm glad that I caught that before you deleted the tweet. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I'll disagree slightly. I still think there's about the same number of teams that are pretty good. Like, I don't think that there's a lot of crazy upsets and stuff that made the tournament interesting. I just think the personalities are more interesting. Mm-hmm. I think the coaches are more interesting. I think the fact that they've highlighted the players and you have people that, be, if it's because it's the TikTok era or whatever you want to attribute it to, but yeah, there's people that connect with Angel Reese more than they connected with maybe Brittany Griner back in the day, and they connect with Caitlin Clark more than they connected with whoever else you want to name from back in the day, Diana Taurasi or something. Like I know they were plenty popular, but there just seems to be more of a of a connection, and I, I don't know. I, I think part of that might have to do with social media. But it also just might be the coverage itself of like they're actually making it seem important and making it feel like it's a big deal on ESPN more than they used to. I, I don't know, but whatever it is, you hope that they can bottle it up, they being the, the sports uh, leaders, and you know apply it to seasons to come because they obviously are on a little hot streak right now. You're not going to have Kalen Clark to fall back on or Angel Reese any longer, so who are going to be the stars that, that carry you forward? Is it going to be Flauge Johnson or – you know, any other number of, of people, uh, who's the next page Beckers, you know, but they've, they've had an incredible cast of, of stars to, uh, garner interest. And the coaches obviously have made it interesting as well, whether it's Don Staley's approach or it's Kim Mulkey and her conspiracy theory on her coverage or, you know, whatever it is. And, um, it's made for a fun, uh, run and a very worthy champion in an undefeated South Carolina, uh, which uh, we can get to where Don Staley now sits because I always find that kind of interesting when you won multiple titles of where you are all time. So I can mention that in a second if I need to. But um, she's now entering new territory as a coach. South Carolina's not going anywhere. Um, I think Texas is in a really good spot. Yep. I think LSU's obviously not going to go anywhere. UConn's not going to go anywhere. And uh, we'll just see you know, who can uh, kind of join that and what the new – cast of stars is going to look like but they've got some that are going to carry over they're going to be losing some big ones but what a year for women's basketball and it's not just a you say it just because you wish it was true it's like no it's actually true this year like they got big ratings and big stars and big attention and uh, I think it's great all right now one of the things though that seems to happen and it did happen over the weekend although we'll have a a response from Lynette Woodard the former Kansas great who I covered back when she was at KU and I was at Stephen F. Austin uh, this is from Rob Donaldson. Diana Taurasi, Sue Bird, Lynette Woodard, Cheryl Swoops, Andrea Carter. All this talk from current former players about inspiring and empowering women's basketball only to on the brightest young star every chance they get the commentary that surrounds women's basketball. There seemed to be this pushback uh, about, well, she may not be the great, which is, by the way, as the sport gets more and more attention, We could argue all throughout the day on Willie Mays or Mickey Mantle or Henry Aaron or whoever ace, Babe Ruth or Lou Gehrig. It's part of sports, and it gets more and more attention, so you're getting more and more of these arguments about where she is among the greatest of all time. But I did see kind of a bitterness in some cases from some 
uh, including Lynette Woodard, who made this comment about Caitlin Clark. She was kind of like talking about, well, I still consider myself the all-time scoring leader. But then she came back with a statement to clarify her remarks. And in fact, you can go two-thirds of the way down. Caitlin holds the scoring record. I salute her. We'll be cheering for her throughout the rest of her career, which, of course, ended yesterday. Uh, and I accepted Iowa's invitation earlier for her senior day. Uh, and she was discussing about comparing stats from 40 years ago compared to now, which we do even in all sports, whether it's quarterback yards passing now compared to others. Well, there it was does seem to be that, that, that one of the things when it comes to women's athletics is you have this, man, we need more coverage, and they're getting it. We need more people to know what we're doing, and it's by far better than it's ever been before. But there's still kind of this holding on to the old and not allowing maybe some of the new and fresh. Now, just some, but those are some of the biggest names in women's basketball history. And I saw a little bit of that kickback, and I don't understand why. Yeah, I don't know. I think sometimes it, you get jealous or you get, well, nobody g gave me this attention when we were doing similar things. And it's true. It's true. And that, like, um, you know, Part of it just needs to be that the fan base of female basketball fans needs to come together and enjoy and go buy tickets more, which they are starting to do. But that's that's the the untapped well that we have not gotten to yet. But yeah, they need to stop fighting and just enjoy it. Like the fact that people are talking about it now. Finally, it's you. Um, I know that people get mad when they think like, well, they're getting all this now, but we all laid all the groundwork. You should be proud of that. Like we struggled so that they could succeed. I'm so happy that someone like Kaylin Clark or Paige Beckers or whoever can get all this publicity because we wanted it so bad and we worked so hard for it. That's just such a, I mean, I, I don't care much about any of that. And I didn't, I didn't pick up on much of that. I didn't, you know, listen to the alt broadcast or wherever most of this was being said, but I mean, that's to be expected, I guess, to some extent. But the whole attitude of like, well, we didn't get covered, so you shouldn't either. If that's at all the case, then that's just being a bitter, old, um, uh, hung up and, and sad person because you should be celebrating that anybody's getting attention. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know much about all of what's being referenced there, but uh, if you were Diana Taurasi or whoever else, you should be over the moon that people care and that they actually truly care and might care for longer than just – a couple of weeks but you know that's up to the game to to extend this and you know I'm still not sold that we're going to be talking about this on a yearly basis as much as we have um, because who's to say that Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark can be followed up uh, and and there are more pieces to that puzzle uh, I know Mulkey will be back and Staley will be back and Floje will be back and so on and so forth and there will be new names but there was just a special mix of ingredients this year so let's see what they can do with it but yeah it's not going to help bottling up that magic if some of the sports pioneers are sitting there dogging on it you know simultaneously all right let's break here